Hello, welcome to day four of the Scope live stream. Today the theme is who we are consumers. However, now we will start with a presentation from Dr. Roberto Sussman. So allow me to enter him into the studio. Hi. Hey, how are you? Uh, well, normal, bringing a polluted Mexican Mexico City air. <laughs> Yeah, I understand. So today you are going to be talking about the WHO Global Tobacco Report, correct? Well, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I'm um, I'm going to talk about the uh, the aerosol that we inhale and <clears throat> the chemical properties. I will also talk a little bit about uh, the relation um, between COVID and uh, and vaping, and uh, this will give me an opportunity to criticize a lot of studies that uh, claim uh, that uh, our lungs uh, that are inflamed and there are lots of problems with the lungs, etc. And I uh, will touch different topics uh, related. They all they uh, the the report of the WHO. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing, perhaps, I will not uh, touch in this in this talk, will be the issue that uh, whether smoking, uh, vaping, is, is good in cessation. If there is time, I, I, I can also talk about that. But mostly, okay. I'm going to show uh, really hard data on the chemistry of this, on the toxicity, and to what degree people who claim that. Uh, They are flat earthers. Okay. Do you want to show your presentation? Yes, sure. Let, let me start with the, the first one. Okay. Uh, share screen. Uh, you can interrupt me all the time and ask okay. questions, right? Okay. It's feel free to ask questions. Uh, okay. So share and uh, share screen. And then, um, yes, share screen. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And uh, <laughs> I'm a, a window. And mm -hmm. the window will be... Um, uh, yeah, this one. Okay. Share. But okay. I will start from the very beginning. Uh, okay. No, no, not this one. It's Let okay. me... The one that I'm um, that I'm sharing is this one, this one, this one. I wonder if you can see. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone. Hold on. Um, can people see? What, um, you might have to ma make it bigger. Yeah, that should be good. Hold can on. people see it? I just asked the question, so let's see. It should be fine. It's okay. The same as so, it, well, yeah. Carry on, and I will. Yep. Everybody can see it. So, carry on. I give you the floor, doctor. Okay. So the what every vapor should know about vaping science and uh, science, I mean, the chemistry, the the physical physical chemistry of the uh, what we call vapor. Uh, some basic definitions. We need some basic definitions that people should know. Um, let's say, uh, okay, uh, okay. Now, aerosol. An aerosol is a substrate of particles that we call particulate matter or fa or phase PM that are suspended and or transported by a gas medium. Right. Everything that has this property can be called an aerosol. It is an extremely wide definition because a, a sandstorm is in a way an aerosol. Clouds that we see in aerosols. When we boil water and we see this vapor, it's an aerosol. Um, um, soot in do and dust are also aerosols. Smoke. So it's a very wide concept. It depends on what are the particles, what type of particles and what size they are, 
and it, they are microscopic particles. I'm talking about particles are too small to be seen, much smaller than an air air width. Okay, and also it depends on the gas. There are different types of gases that are um, that are suspended. Like for example, when we talk, the respiratory uh, particles, droplets. When we talk, these are bioaerosols because they have a biological but the aerosols as well. Now visibility. When is an aerosol visible? It is when the particle number density, when there are sufficient number of particles, uh, they diffuse light, they scatter light, right? And this is why we see it. Uh, that's why, for example, we can see somebody smoking a cigarette because the number of particles are on the range of millions per cubic centimeters. But when somebody is talking, we cannot see the aerosol because there are too few number of particles, maybe five or 10, or in an extreme case, 50 particles per cubic centimeter. Now, in a very cold day, you can see the breath because why? what happens then is that uh, water droplets from our mouth condense into the cold air, then we can see it. Now, we call them anthropogenic when they are produced by human activities, right? So uh, the aerosol from e-cigarettes or smoke or, or cigarette smoke and many others are anthropocentric. We make them, but the clouds and the sandstorm are not anthropogenic, right? So it's very important to have this basic definition. Okay, so let's go to our subject. We know smoking and vaping they look very similar, right? They're both anthropogenic aerosols, right? But appearances can be deceiving, right? Because they're very different aerosols and we're going to see that. Now, vapor is a colloquial term that we use for e-cigarette aerosol, right? But uh, in, well, we, let's see, I, I, we, we'll continue using the, the term vapor because it's already there and it's not a technical term. People are entitled to use a community. We are a community of vapors. We are entitled to use the term that we want. Once I had a very rispid argument with a public health guy that said, no, 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 I don't care what you say about physicochemical properties that define smoke. For me, you are smoking. You can say you are vaping, but for me, you are smoking. And I told him, I told him the F word very hard. <laughs> I said, you don't have the right to impose to a community your terms. Uh, we as a community decide that we use the term vaping and vapor. And we don't care what public health idiots or technocrats decide. It is us that we decide to use the term vapor. But... We have to be clear that it's not vapor because vapor is also clearly defined in physical chemical terms. Now let's see what e-cigarette vapor is substituting. It is substituting tobacco smoke. So let's look at tobacco smoke, right? What happens when we light a cigarette? Here is somebody lighting a cigarette. Well, first we have combustion. Combustion is an exothermic oxidation process. Why oxygen? Because oxygen atoms are very eager to make reactions. They have one, uh, their last orbital desperately needs an electron, right? So they are like very, very, like very horny to, to, yeah. to, to, to get, to, to get into, uh, together with other compounds and, and get this electron that they're missing, right? So oxygen is the key element. Without oxygen, there is no combustion. This is important because uh, there were some claims that, for example, not, uh, well, not so much with these cigarettes, but with uh, heated tobacco products. Like the WHO says that, no, 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 heated tobacco products is smoke. But this is total, totally, no, total nonsense because an experiment was done Okay, it was done by PMI scientists, but it was well done, where they show that 
and that you can use a heated tobacco product in an environment that is completely devoid of oxygen, right? So that means that there was no combustion because without oxygen, simply there is no combustion. So combustion takes place between 800 and 950 degrees centigrade, so very high temperature. That's why you see it red. Now, what happens? Uh, this this uh, combusted uh, this combustion has to go into a 10 centimeter long narrow cylinder and it has to arrive to the mouth at temperatures between 30 and 40 degrees centigrade otherwise people would would not be able to smoke they, their, their mouth would be burned right mm -hmm. so yeah. what happens between between 800 and 950 degrees centigrade well it happens a lot uh, lots of processes. In fact, uh, perhaps we can say that most of the toxic substances are produced uh, along the way. For example, we have this, we have this processes, and I will. It's basically transport and cooling. But let me explain these this processes. First, there is convection. Convection is when you move a gas, and here in this case, it's an aerosol. Uh, that you move it along a trajectory. That's convection. And here it's a force convection because the user is exerting negative pressure to suck, right? Now, when this convection happens, uh, there, there are two, there is one process called distillation. In which there's a tendency to separate particles uh, from gas because combustion will produce particles and will produce also gas. Uh, I can. Uh, I don't want to go too much into technical details, but this is very well understood. Even at the molecular level, how molecules form clusters, and these clusters, they form particles, and how the heat disgregates them, etc. But now, once particles and gases are separated, some of the particles vaporize. And right, and some uh, of the uh, some of the gases condense. Vaporization is transforming vapor into liquid, and condensation is the opposite. Is liquid? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Vaporization is liquid into gas, and condensation is gas into liquid. And this happens continuously, but it it is not happening to one molecule. It is happening to thousands of molecules. All of them have different temperatures where these processes happen. So it's an extremely complex process. The chemistry of cigarette smoking is extremely complicated. It is, uh, there are still subjects or still areas or points that are not well understood. But this is essentially what is happening. It is very complex, it's a very complex process. When the WHO says, well, you can have combustion without lighting, then you can have, and, uh, sorry, there is another process that I forgot to mention, which are two processes that happen here. One of them is pyrolysis and pyrosynthesis. This means that uh, bigger molecules disgregate into smaller ones. This is pyrolysis, but then the smaller ones can recombine. And this is pyrosynthesis, right? This just adds to the complexity. Now, the WHO says that all these processes happen, but they, that doesn't mean that the heated tobacco products uh, uh, have combustion, you know, that because these processes would not happen without the combustion, right? And they can happen at certain temperatures without combustion, but that doesn't mean that there is combustion. So uh, the WHO, in this document that they uh, released, uh, they are... They, they are deceiving the public because they are confusing, right? So this yeah. is what happens when we light the cigarette. Okay. okay. So uh, we have two different... Actually, when uh, we talk about cigarette smoke, we have very two very distinct aerosols. Here, somebody smoking. So there is a mainstream emission, which is what goes into the mouth 
of the uh, of the smoker that's a mainstream emission this is about 20 25 percent of the total mass of the aerosol of the initial aerosol and then there is the side stream emission which is what comes out from the burning or smoldering tip of the cigarette and this is between 75 and 80 percent of the mass that is uh, some of it is also inhaled uh, by the by the smoker by the nose or by the mouth but most of it is released to the environment and it forms the uh, the secondhand smoke most of the secondhand smoke is by this side stream emission question yes um in the heated tobacco sticks they are much smaller than a cigarette so i'm going to presume then that the reason they're that much smaller is because you don't have the side stream emission and the wastage so therefore what you're getting you're getting what it, it's all what you inhale so there's none of the i hope i'm not i'm not articulating this no, 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 you're, you're correct but there is a little bit of side stream emission also in heated tobacco product but it's very small and they, they also produce heated tobacco products also produce a little bit of carbon monoxide because some some people believe in fact i made this error some some years ago that uh, the presence of carbon monoxide was a sign of combustion that's not true you can generate a carbon monoxide without combustion with okay. some sort of pyrolytic processes but yeah you are right but there is a little bit of side stream yeah okay thank okay. you now separation of gas phase this is what happens how do you separate the gas phase from the particulate phase in tobacco smoke well it is done um, it is difficult to do that with a side stream emission because side stream emission uh, dilutes very fast into the environment so you would have to have sensors and it can be done but mostly it is done with the mainstream emission and uh, it is done with the smoking machines because you cannot put inside of the throat of a person you cannot put a detector so it is done by smoking machines and essentially the smoke is made to pass through fiberglass filters that are known as cambridge filters you can see the illustration here and uh, gas nicotine and water pass this filter but uh, whatever is retained in this filter is called tar. Tar is tobacco aerosol residue. Tar is not the thing that you use to pave roads. Well, it is called tar, but this is not the tar of cigarettes. The tar of cigarettes is what is retained in these filters. And this is what we assume to be the, the particulate phase of the mainstream emission. It's a bit artificial but this is star, right? Now, um, the saying goes that uh, there are more than 7,000 compounds that, that, are, that are in cigarette smoke. Well, we have to, to, to be careful about that because these are detected. The, that these are the number of detected compounds. And this number depends on the uh, instrument resolution. If we have more resolution, we'll detect more. The less were detected because the instruments were not very precise. Really, what we have is about uh, 1,200 uh, detected in decent concentrations, meaning not in negligible concentrations that appear. The other ones appear at rest, the traces just above the detection limit, right? But still, it is true that we're dealing with a chemical jungle. Yeah. It's all about parts per million, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Instruments have a limit of detection, and yes, you can use parts per uh, really parts per million are already detectable. We're, we're talking about parts per billion that okay. they, that can still be detected, right? But this compound will appear in in trace levels, right? And if you can, if if, you, if your instrument is uh, more precise you'll detect more of them. So the number of detected compounds is not very relevant. What is relevant is the ones that are detected in decent quantities. Now let's see the main compounds. Nicotine, well, the smoker, 
uh, inhales about 20-25% 2 milligrams of the total uh, nicotine that is in the plant because most of it will go with a side stream emission. Now we know it's not carcinogenic. Then we have the end, the tobacco, uh, re, tobacco specific nitrosamines. These are compounds that are carcinogenic. And uh, it is assumed that 50% of what is inhaled comes directly from the tobacco plant, right? Because it's part of the chemical process interaction between nitrogen and amines there are compounds of the of the chemic of the plant we also have a, a group of compounds called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons pas these are products of incomplete combustion they're generated by pyrolysis and uh, there are about 539 that appear in non negligible quantities 16 of them are carcinogenic then we have uh, volatile organic compounds that are generated all by evaporation and pyrolysis are volatile. Volatile means easiness to evaporate, essentially. Like 500 of them are found in non-negligible uh, quantities. About 10 of them are carcinogenic, and they tend to be in the gas phase. For example, carbon monoxide, uh, nitric oxides, sulfuric ox sulfur oxides, these are volatile gases and then tend to be in the gas phase, right? Yeah. The, then we also have heavy metals in small quantities and especially cadmium, lead, and mercury. How do these metals come to the cigarette? Cigarettes have no metal because they're already in the plant. The tobacco plant is, uh, is in, in the air and uh, there are metals in, the, in, in air and the, because metals are part of nature and these metals deposit in the plant and when the whole process comes these metals join in and they might combine to make uh, metallic compounds right so they're they're there and also we have things like additives paper and filters that i'm not going to bother about them but they also they also as you can see this is a toxic cocktail Mm -hmm. And uh, the additives, papers, and filters, they add to the toxicity as well. But also, they, they, can, be, they can mitigate the toxicity. But it's a, very, it's a very complex chemistry, and it is a toxic cocktail, a toxic chemical cocktail. Question. Yes? Um, one of the Adam in chat is asking, is there any reason why cigarettes haven't been engineered to deliver more than that 20 to 30 percent to the mouth? Um, it is very difficult because of the when you light the cigarette, you will generate immediately the side stream emission. So I, don't, I cannot see how can you redirect the nicotine that is in the side stream emission and that can be in the gas or the particle phase, uh, how can you redirect that to the mouth? It's going to be very difficult with combustion. Thank uh, you. I cannot see how can that be done. Okay. Thank so, you. and now let's see how vapor, now we, we saw what, what vapor is replacing. Now let's see how the electronic cigarette aerosol is generated and I think that every vapor should know this. It's not very difficult. In fact, it's, bo it's, it's boring in comparison with tobacco smoke. It's a boring chemistry, right? Okay. How is vapor generated? Well, here is a semblance of, a, of an e-cigarette. Uh, first, the battery supplies energy that will heat the coil in the resistance at temperatures between 180 and 200 degrees centigrade. These are the normal operating temperatures of vapor devices, right? When you say watts, you are talking about power. Power is energy divided by time. So if you, pu if you put like say 100 watts and you puff for four seconds, you are putting uh, 400 joules. Joules is an, it's an unit of energy. You are putting energy. The energy is heating in the form of heat, right? 
and uh, then heat is energy essentially so okay. then what happens the e-liquid is wetting the wick and this heat generates in the wick and in the liquid around it, it generates a vapor this is a vapor vapor is liquid made into gas right and this uh, vapor it depends the temperature depends because we are boiling a mixture right and but typically first the uh, propylene glycol boils and then the because boiling point of propylene glycol is lower than uh, uh, vegetal glycerin but we generate this vapor right uh, you can say you can see it for example if you take your e-cigarette and push the bottom without inhaling you will hear a and you will hear you will see a little bit of gas there right so that's the vapor but that's not vaping what is vaping when the user inhales it generates a negative pressure that sucks this vapor and as this vapor is sucked it moves right by convection and then it cools and this vapor condenses what is condensation it's a gas transformed into liquid and it condenses and it forms liquid droplets to the water vapor this droplet uh, as they enter your mouth they grow as they approach your mouth because of the humidity of your mouth they grow and they grow because propylene glycol and uh, vegetable glycerin are hygroscopic that is they absorb water so these droplets which are liquid droplets they they and they have to be liquid because it's a condensation uh, by people who say solid particles etc they are wrong uh, well, there are some solid particles i'll explain later in a, in a very negligible quantity because of the metals i'll explain that later but okay. this is how this is the process and i would it, it is not complicated and and vapors should know that how this is generated it's very simple right okay it is uh, it technically it is called condensed nucleation but i'm not going to get into this technical detail okay questions here no they're discussing about um how uh, like i said before it's you know a very inefficient delivery device with such fatal consequences and and, and that this also explains why a lot of smokers chain smoke to self titrate um and how efficient vaping is with the nicotine titration yes. so yes because here in this case uh, there is no side stream so most of the nicotine not all of it because there is still some dissipation some loss of mass some of the nicotine might not uh, get into uh, when you suck some of the nicotine might remain in the e-liquid or might uh, deposit in the walls or whatever but it is much more efficient than the cigarette and the same you can say the same thing i'm saying but the chemistry is different though but uh, there are some analogies with cannabis vaping right also when you when you vape cannabis or you vaporize cannabis you get like uh, between 80 and 90 percent efficiency in terms of the psychoactive absorption uh, with regards to smoking to smoking cannabis but that's right it's true it's, it's a more efficient process in yeah respect. somebody mentioned as well and that's why they process the tobacco with ammonia and other chemicals to make the nicotine more easily absorbed in the body that's right that's right but, but I, I did not want to go into because I know, I'm I, just letting you know no no that's fine that's fine so thanks for that comment that's very useful okay so now at normal operation temperatures let's say between 110 and 250 degrees there are no chemical reactions right that's right so the chemical processes are very simple and this means that the chemical composition of the aerosol is almost the same as that of the e-liquid 
this does not happen with smoking. If you look at the chemical composition of the tobacco plant, it is going to be very different from the chemical composition of the tobacco smoke because of the chemical reactions. A reaction is a very energetic process in which compounds, uh, different compounds join and make completely other different compounds, right? Here, there, the, well, there are some changes as, as I will illustrate. What we have is basically what is called a change of phase. That's evaporation, one compound it's, uh, it's uh, evaporated, it, it's uh, liquid, becomes gas by heating. And then there is condensation, that is the opposite. A gas compound becomes liquid, this is cooling, this happens. And then we also happen what is called thermal decomposition. This is a low energy pyrolysis because it's a low temperature. And the, what happens is that molecular bounds break because of the heating. So large molecules unbound in small molecules. But, in, uh, uh, and this happens also in the in the e-cigarette. So, uh, and then we also have metallic compounds. Why metals? It's a negligible amount of metals because e-cigarettes are metallic, are made of metal, right? So what happens between the a e-liquid and the coil or between the the e-liquid and the interface the e-liquids also have traces of metal what happens there are several processes and one process is adsorption adsorption it's a sort of it's an exchange of atoms in in, in this interface there's exchange of ions and these ions might combine with the oxygen with the air in the oxygen and form oxides. Most of the metals are metallic oxides, but there's a, it is really negligible quantities, and these come in. Uh, they either aggregate to the to the liquid droplets, or they form nanoparticles, particles of very 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 small number. So, truly, there is a you know there there are some uh, solid particles, but they are one in 10 million, right? If you take yeah. all the liquid particles, 10 million of them, maybe one will be will be one metallic particle, right? Yeah. So, but okay. this happens also. So in a sense, what we have is here is the liquid that is at ambient temperature. Uh, we heat it. So what happens with PG? It evaporates, but it can also decompose into aldehydes. VG, it evaporates and condenses, but it can also decompose into aldehydes and flavorings. When we say flavorings, we're talking about a lot of compounds, a lot of them, right? When you say I'm vaping strawberry cake, it is not a strawberry cake. It's a set of chemicals that, that emulate the, that flavor. So these chemicals, when, when you heat them, they decompose and they form aldehydes, right? But some scare studies that say, oh, look at all these compounds because of the flavor in danger, danger. But you have to see that uh, these compounds are, are in a very, very small, small concentrations, right? Now, what happens with the nicotine? It evaporates and condenses. It has both, both processes, depends on the type of nicotine depends on the pH of the nicotine, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, water, it passes from droplets to gas. So now we have the aerosol and the aerosol, 99%, more than 99%, is like maybe 99.7% of the mass of the aerosol. I'm talking about the mass, the milligrams, right? Mm -hmm. It is PG, mostly in the gas phase, VG, mostly in the droplets. Nicotine can be in the, in, the, in the gas phase or can be in the droplets. It is usually in both of them. Then water is mostly in the gas phase. And these compounds, these four compounds, make more than 99% of the mass. Basically, 
we are inhaling this, right? Now, less than 1% of the mass are traces of the aldehydes. All these aldehydes that decompose, uh, I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about them in a minute. They, they, uh, they make less than 1%. And the negligible traces of metallic compounds are even more negligible, right? But, you know, these things exist this is why we say that vaping is not innocuous, uh, but we because we have these traces of these quantities that are toxic. But you, we have to see the amount. If you would make the same, the same sort of percentage thing or, uh, with the uh, with the tobacco cigarette, it would not be ninety nine percent to one. It would be much more. I would say that probably 60% or 70% of the mass of the tobacco smoke is toxic, yeah. right? Because tobacco smoke also has water, has nicotine, has oxygen, has compounds that are not per se toxic, right? Because also toxicity depends on the, on the, on the dose and depends on the temperature, right? So a compound like nitrogen, it is harmless at atmospheric pressure. But if you go, if you increase the pressure, it becomes reactive and can be toxic. This is the problem of, of people who dive very deep. Yep. They have to control the nitrogen, right? Yeah. Okay. Depends. So this is what we are inhaling. It's 99%. There are compounds that are not toxic. Propylene glycol, glycerol, they are used as solvent in many medicines. Nicotine, well, we know that it's um, nicotine we have, well, they say they say it's the devil, but it is not carcinogenic. It is not really a toxic substance. In the, in the doses that we, are, that we are inhaling it, because nicotine can be very toxic to insects in plants, but we are not insects. We are much bigger than they are. Okay, so now... The chemical composition, as you can see, is almost the same as that of the e-liquid. Okay, so studies of analytic chemistry, um, they're used uh, to, uh, very similar to what is done with cigarettes, with cigarette machines. But uh, this is done with vaping machines. This vaping machines are essentially a cigarette There's some adaptation to make them uh, able for vaping products, right? Now, they what they do, these vaping machines, is regimented, standardized puffing regime. This means that the vaping machine is programmed to do four-second puffs. That's an example. This is a typical protocol. Four-second puffs every 30 seconds for five to 100 times. Okay. This is what these machines do. Now, problems. Human vapors don't do that. I've never seen a human vapor that will do four second puffs every seconds 50 times. Have you ever met a human vapor doing that? I'm sure you have. No. Right? No. no. So that's one problem. Now, Vaping machines do not taste. A human vapor will say, ah, this is horrible. I'm not going to vape this shit. A vaping machine will never say that. The vaping machine keeps operating it. They don't taste. They're machines, right? Well, one time, probably in the future, we will develop a robot that will be able to taste, right? But we haven't reached that stage. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The airflow and puff volume in these vaping machines are appropriate for mouth to lung vaping with devices of more than one ohm. Because these were machines designed for cigarettes, right? Yeah. And uh, mouth to lung is not very different from cigarette smoking in terms of airflows, in terms of puff volumes, and so on. So you can say that the Puffing parameters are roughly appropriate for mouth to lung, right? But they are not appropriate for sub ohm vaping. Sub ohm vaping cannot be tested in these machines, right? 
And if you try to do that, if you put a very powerful device in one of these machines, we're going to get very, very mistaken results. Finally, we can say that although these machines do not reproduce the human experience, if the puffing parameters are appropriate, they can be rough indicators of what we are inhaling, right? This is also very important because a lot of this, uh, of these ideas, uh, graphs that you show in proportion, you know, formaldehyde is 1% mm -hmm. that is found in cigarettes and so on. It is These are results from vaping machines. Likely right. they are overestimations because vaping machines do not reproduce human experience. One exercise for you, try to do a regimented coughing of this type and you will see that after puff number 20, you are tired, you are exhausted. So likely these results represent overestimations of what normal vapors do, unless you are a fanatic vapor that is vaping all the time, 12 hours or 2000 times. But there are very few vapors like that, right? Questions here? Yeah, I mean, it, this basically explains why a lot of the studies come up and, and it's like, you know, they fry a coil or they get dry hits and they get these No, no, no. Crazy... No, I'm talking about studies that do it correctly in the normal oh, okay. ranges. Even those studies, uh, most likely, uh, well, absolutely likely, not, not most likely, they are giving you overestimations simply because uh, the puffing regimes are too extreme for human vapors. They can give you a rough indication of what you are inhaling, right? The proportions and so on. But they tend to be overestimations because human vapors do not do standardized puffing regimes, right? Even yeah. at standard conditions. No, what you're talking is different. I'm going, to, I, I'm going to address that also. Okay. Okay. So toxicity comparisons. To what we compare? Okay, typically we compare with the percentage of abundance of the same compound in cigarette smoke. This is a typical comparison. You say, well, uh, we find a, a proline, but it is in uh, one tenth of a percentage of what is found in cigarette smoke, right? This is a typical comparison, but sometimes it's not a good comparison. I'll explain why. Another one is counting the number of hazardous or potentially hazardous HPHC compounds or carcinogenic compounds with respect to tobacco smoke. That's a bad comparison. And, I, and I've got several medical doctors doing it with good intention because they say, well, there are 70 carcinogenic compounds in tobacco smoke and there are only four, there are only three in e-cigarettes and three is like five percent of 70 bad comparison because you know you can have three three compounds that are very toxic extremely toxic even uh, nasty venoms and they can do more harm than 70. so that's a very bad comparison don't do that it's not uh, it's not the amount of, the number of compounds it is the it is other things it's the proportion of them and then there is a, another comparison, which I prefer, is in terms of the total aerosol mass. I have a mass of aerosol. What percentage of the mass of these aerosols is made by toxic compounds? Now, you can say, well, if you uh, breathe, if you inhale a very, very tiny, tiny, whiny amount of uh, of, of uh, say, ur uh, ur uh, uranium, uranium oxide, you die. And it's true. It's a very toxic compound, extremely toxic. And there are venoms that it, you only need to inhale or eat or, 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 uh, or drink a, a very, very small amount to die. But the type of compounds that we have here, the aldehydes, are not are not potent venoms, right? And they are not uranium oxide. We're not talking about that. 
they are not um, sued or, uh, or so we're not talking about that we're not we, so the mass comparison is appropriate because we're not talking about very powerful venoms right so this is my preferred comparison and then there is another comparison that is compulsory the comparison with reference value. And, uh, here there's a discussion because um, the most common used are the occupational reference values. And uh, these are okay because uh, electronic cigarette usage is voluntary adult usage. The same like uh, occupational hazards, right? If I'm going to work in a factory where I know that I'll be exposed to certain toxic compounds, I'm volunteering for that. And the obligation of the managers of the factory is to keep the level of these toxic compounds below what the National Institute of Occupational Health and uh, uh, Safety and Health, the NIOSH, will recommend, or the OSHA, or whatever one applies in your country, they will apply, right? But I'm volunteering for that. Now, some California, and I, you know, California is a place obsessed with little amounts of toxicity. There is yeah. this California, I don't know, 65 proposition where even coffee eh, will give you cancer, right? So these <laughs> Californian fanatics, they say, oh, no, 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 but occupational eh, the standards are not protective enough. They are not protective for the general population. Toddlers and pregnant women and elderly people will not be protected. But come on, folks, you do not test the safety on whis of whiskey by giving a toddler a glass of whiskey, right? Whiskey is not for toddlers. It's not for pregnant women uh, that the, who normally do not drink. It is not for elderly people with a chronic disease, you're not going to give them a bottle of whiskey and then make them almost die and say, whiskey is not safe. Sorry, whiskey is not safe. You are an adult. No, no, no. Whiskey is not safe for you. So these Californian people are really, are really wrong. And we have to, whenever they tell you, no, 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 the occupational toxicology is not sufficiently protective, we say, well, it is a product for voluntary adult usage. And you do not test whiskey with babies, period, right? We have, yeah, we have a comment or two. Um, okay, one, Ian said California may be carcinogenic, which of course I find hilarious because I've been in smog in LA. Um, and then <laughs> Adam is like, the UK study of air quality standing on a street is playing in his mind. So, I mean, that those comparisons, I guess, is what that, what you've just said is popping into people's minds about exposure. Yes, that's true. You know, we're exposed to all sorts of, you know, the, the, the idea of zero contamination, zero pollution, zero, it, it is nonsense. It doesn't exist. And if it exists, if you would put somebody in a bubble like that, the moment that person steps out in London or even in the countryside, everywhere, countryside that have pollen and all sorts of pollutants, the moment that person would step out of the bubble would die because yeah. our body has defenses. So there is a minimal level of pollution that we tolerate. What we're talking about pollution is not absence of pollution. It is putting pollution in levels that our defenses can cope with. You know, notice that cigarette smoke, as toxic as it is, Cigarette smoke does not kill people in three days, does not kill people in three years. It kills people in three decades. This means to what degree our defenses are good. When some pneumologists, and this keep this because it can be a very good counter answer to some pneumologists. Some pneumologists, uh, my experience is with the Spanish society of pneumologists and some Mexican pneumologists, they say our lungs were designed for clean air. So don't put this, this aerosol, I don't care if it's 
less toxic than smoke. It is toxic and our lungs were designed for clean air. Well, this is an absolute nonsense because our lungs are able to fend off tobacco smoke for a long time. If you smoke 10 years and you quit, there is epidemiological evidence that you will more or less evolve like a non-smoker. That is, our lungs can process five years of continuous exposure to something as toxic as tobacco smoke and recover. So our lungs are not designed for clean air, which doesn't exist. There is no clean air. Air everywhere has metals, has sulfur, has all sorts of nitrates, and even in the countryside, right? So clean air doesn't exist. Our lungs are designed to process a certain amount of toxicity, right? And uh, it might come as an adaptation of our ancestors who lived in caves and they had to light fires. So there was probably a natural adaptation that allowed our lungs to process a certain amount of smoke, right? But our lungs are not designed what well, that would be correct. And this is behind a valley. Our lungs are not designed to breathe um, droplets, uh, fat droplets of oil. That really destroys our lungs. And this is what happened with the, with the valley, right? But our lungs smoke, they can process it. Well, what happens with smoking? That after years and years and years, our defenses become depleted. And then smoke overcomes our defenses. But this is a long process, right? And this is important to bear in mind. So toxicity is always relative. And, and, uh, and in the case of vaping, vaping is a product for adults, voluntary consumption. Therefore, occupational uh, standards are appropriate. And when you hear this, that is not protective enough, you can, you, know, you can tell them that you do not test the safety of whiskey with, with toddlers or with pregnant women, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. Chemical composition of vapor. The aerosol mass, as I mentioned, is 99% of these compounds. Now, what's on the rest? The rest are byproducts. There are many of them. You can detect about between 100 and 130 compounds. And as I insist, the number of the detected compounds depends on the sensitivity of your instruments. But the main ones are these three guys, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and acrolein. The rest of them, there are many others, but they are in very, very small quantities. So I'm not going to deal with them. Now they make between one ten thousandth to one thousandth of the aerosol mass. So if you weigh them, they are, they are almost insignificant in terms of the aerosol mass, right? And then we have a despicably negligible traces of nickel, zinc, and lead. And they make between one in a million to 10 in a million of the aerosol mass. So this is in terms of masses, what we are inhaling. I'm also going to go into comparison with tobacco smoke, but it's important to know that because when this, uh, okay, these things, they have a contribution. When we inhale, we inhale these things. And this means that these things can also create damage. We still don't know what happens after 40 years of continuous inhalation of these things, but we can be very certain that it is much less than tobacco smoke. When uh, Public Health England says 5%, that's an overestimation. It is much less than 5%, but the percentage is very difficult to estimate because we are comparing two different chemical processes. And this comparison is very difficult to make in a correct way.
questions here? Well, no, they're just talking about, you know, um, they love the, the concept of, what was it? Despicably negligible. You just coined right. a new term. Probably going to wind up in um, Urban Dictionary. Uh, yeah, they, they're, everybody's getting it and they understand exactly and they're appreciating this. So thank you. Okay. So uh, comparison with tobacco smoke, let, let's do that. Now, nicotine, we have nicotine, but we, uh, the smoker smokes 20, 25%, but we inhale maybe 80 to 95% of the nicotine in the liquid. Nitrosamines, well, I cannot say no, but they are like uh, in very, very small, the mass of nitrosamines, uh, it's comparable to the metals. It's, it's so much small that we can say that practically no. In terms of mass, right? In terms mm -hmm. of mass of the aerosol, I'm not comparing in terms of proportion with cigarettes, right? Okay. Uh, polycyclic aromatic compounds, no, they are practically absent. And if they are detected here, it is probably because in the smoking machine, some air from the outside got into the, the, the aerosol. It's probably external because e-cigarettes do not have combustion and these are products of combustion, right? So no, we don't have those guys. Volatile organic compounds, there are more, but only three, the three I mentioned, that appear in small doses. Heavy metals, yes, we, there are heavy metals in similar concentrations, but uh, no, in fact, in cigarette smoke, there tend to be more, but there are different metals, right? There, there are different metals because it's cadmium, the only one that is coincident is lead, but mercury and cadmium practically are very, very few in electronic cigarettes, right? And then additives, papers, and filters, absolutely no, nothing like that. So if you compare with tobacco smoke, practically everything is absent. We have the nicotine. Of course, tobacco smoke does not have propylene glycol. Maybe they have, a, I'm really not aware of it, but uh, the, the chemistry is different and it is much more simple. And of course, it is infinitely more benign than tobacco smoke. Like comparing with tobacco smoke, it's, uh, you know, it's overdrive, it's going overdrive. Uh, you know, you can say, and, I, and uh, Professor Glantz once said, and he's right, he said, tobacco smoke is so toxic that anything compared with it will be benign. That's true. But, uh, well, you know, even a scoundrel like Professor Glantz can say, because I think he's a cynic, even a cynic like Professor Glantz can say some things are right. Also, another professor that is very well known, Professor Chapman, sometimes he's right, right? Uh, but in this case, the benignity is extreme and extremely more benign than the tobacco, than tobacco smoke. Okay, let's see data. I'm talking about qualitative terms. Let's see numbers. This is my favorite article because they do a very careful analysis and they do an analysis of this type. See, they tested five devices. Two of them were in overheating conditions. And they say that, and they see the charring and so on. They, they, they say this is overheating conditions. And three of them are in normal operating conditions. The devices were tank devices, not sub ohm. They were tank devices. Some of them were old, but I think that the, the results are still applicable. What they found, the results, the inhaled aerosol mass, they weighted that. And this is something that I like. Not all studies do that, right? Between 1.5 to 28 milligrams per puff. Depends on the power of the, uh, of the device. Like a small device, a dual type or pot type, will generate 1.5 to maybe three 
milligrams. But a tank device, a, not a very powerful one, a mid, mid in the middle a range, will generate like 25, 28 milligrams. And a huge one, a very powerful, can generate up to 50 milligrams per puff. Concentrations, percentage of total mass. For maldehyde, it is about one in 10,000. In terms of mass, I'm comparing milligrams per gram, right? Milligrams per gram, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's like one in, one in 1,000, right? And it is two orders of magnitude or one order of magnitude less than 1,000, right? Acetaldehyde, very similar. Acrolein, even less than that, right? This is proportion in terms of total aerosol mass because they weighted, they weighted, right? Consumption per day. Now, what's a consumption per day? If you assume that the consumption is three grams per, of e-liquid per day, it's a typical, it roughly translates into three uh, milliliters of liquid per day, right? Then formaldehyde, would be between 0 0.4 and 0.25 milligrams per day. Acetaldehyde, slightly smaller. Acrolein, like one or, it's, also, it's smaller. But it's in this range of less than one milligram per day, much less than one milligram per day, right? Now, consumption, let's look at the consumption of cigarettes per day, assuming 15 cigarettes of the same compounds. You can see formaldehyde, it is 1.2 to 1.72. So it's about 100 times, right? Yeah. Acetaldehyde, it is even more than 100. It is several hundreds, right? Acrolein is about one, it's also several hundreds. And this is why people say that formaldehyde roughly makes about between one and 5% of the amounts in, the, in cigarettes, right? And they say acetaldehyde is maybe 1% and acrolein is maybe one half or one tenth of 1%. But notice how even in cigarettes, the amount is very small. So when you look at proportion with respect to cigarettes, you are missing an important information, namely the fact that the amount, the mass of the toxic that you are inhaling is very small in comparison with the rest of the aerosol, right? When you compare to cigarettes, you have to compare in terms of consumption, right? If you consume 15 cigarettes, you will have maybe uh, 50 times more formaldehyde and you will have probably 100 times more acetaldehyde and maybe 1,000 times more acrolein. But come on, these three humble compounds are a minor fraction of the toxicity of the cigarette. So you cannot say, like I, I heard some people, some uh, uh, anti-vapor saying, oh, 5% uh, of uh, formaldehyde, huge. So the e-cigarette is toxic. No. Because that 5% of uh, formaldehyde is less than 1,000. I don't know, I'm guessing less than 1,000th of the toxicity of the cigarette. Because we are not inhaling carbon monoxide, polycyclic harmonic uh, hydrocarbons, uh, all sorts of jungle compounds that are in the cigarette that we're not inhaling. Where yeah. he, what is common with the, with the cigarette, it is not the main toxic uh, uh, elements or compounds of the cigarette. So do you see to what degree what we are inhaling is so much safer than the cigarette? And these are real numbers that people have to keep in mind. So when somebody in the WHO or Mr. Bloomberg or one of these anti-vaping crackpots says that it is as dangerous as electronic as, uh, as tobacco smoke. They are really saying 
2 plus 2 is 5. Or they are saying the earth is flat. Or -hmm. they are saying, you know, whatever nonsense you can think of. This is the Yeah. This, um, Adam said, thank you. He has to leave. Um, He's very informative. This sort of explains in a roundabout way why they're demonizing nicotine now as opposed to um, cigarettes. Because obviously, you know, e-cigarettes deliver the nicotine in a a more effective way, um, in a cleaner way. So the issue that the, the majority of them have, and this is why they've gone from combustion to nicotine because it's the nanny state thing. It's the control thing. I mean, what do you yeah, think? That, that, that's partly true. But what these people forget is that you can control nicotine in vaping. While you can't do that, it's very difficult to do that with, uh, with cigarettes. You know, people mention ammonia and things like that, or additives that are put into a cigarette, but it's very difficult to control it in a precise way. And with vaping, you can, but it is true. You know, the toxicity of the e-cigarette with respect to cigarette is so evident, so patent when you look at numbers that these people have forgotten formaldehyde and have gone to nicotine, to demonize nicotine. That's true. Which also brings up the issue then of like, for example, in New Zealand is one of the countries, the push for uh, very low nicotine cigarettes or to remove the filter um from cigarettes i what's your take on that in order to the anti-nicotine brigade uh yeah uh, for cigarettes to make very yes. low mm-hmm. that's a, that's a useless thing to do uh, it is going to generate black market because look suppose you are in san diego and uh close to a mexican border and then you buy the the i don't know marlboro with the low nicotine but i am in mexico and I manufacture the same box that looks exactly the same across the border. And uh, how can you distinguish low and high nicotine cigarettes? Are, are policemen going to carry their cotton tests? No, they can't. Once the product is out in distribution, it's going to be very difficult to test it. So black markets will, it will be a big, a big, uh, business bust for a business uh, a opportunity for Mexican cartels and, uh, but al- and also American cartels. Yeah. But also, I, you know, if people are smoking for the nicotine and let's just say, and there are these people, they, they exist that the vaping doesn't work for them. Okay. E-liquid vaping doesn't work for them. So people are smoking combustible, you know, using combustible tobacco for the nicotine. If the nicotine is not in the, the, the cigarette, the, the theory that these people that are pushing the VLNCs are, is that, oh, they'll just stop smoking. Th- no, there's a lot. Of- uh, you know, this is a prohibitionist argument. If you remove the, uh, the supply, the demand will vanish. That's not true. That, that's, that doesn't happen. No, I'm very much against that. I think it's a very silly measure. It is part of the drug of wars and so on. And I think it will not work. I'm very much against that. I've argued this. In fact, I even told uh, once in a, in a, in a uh, one of these American summits, I, I had a one minute talk with Mitch Seller. And I told him that. I told him, you are going to make a very big business opportunity with Mexican cartels. And he dismissed me, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's uh, go on uh, because there's a lot of material. Now, some people have, some studies have found extremely high concentrations. Well, that's junk science. And this is a famous formaldehyde scandal that they found. They, they did not find exactly formaldehyde. They found what is sort of formaldehyde facilitators, hemicyclicals, or I don't remember the exact technical name, molecules that if they are around, they will produce formaldehyde but in huge quantities, much be, much more than in cigarettes. So it was refuted and replicated by Farsalinos. We all know that. In fact, Farsalinos refuted and replicated two or three of these type of scandals. So what was the problem? We all know that. Devices were tasted under abnormal usage that we call dry heat, 
when liquid depletes, the coil begins pyrolyzing the wick. And, uh, and this is repellent to human vapors. But machines, as we already discussed, machines have no taste. They just keep operating as instructed. So, but something that I need to comment here is that these guys, the guys that do junk science, there are many of them, they're well paid. They, they have a, a full job, full-time job. They know that they have to find horrors in electronic cigarettes, right? They have to find horrors because then they get grants and they are promoted because that's the American, as what I discussed yesterday, that's what that's the American me, uh, medical institution is against vaping because of things that I discussed yesterday, right? Political things. So this uh, influences funding and influences the way science is developed. So there are many of them, but how many Farsalinos we have? Very few. And poor all, uh, he's my friend, poor old Constantinos, he's, he's an orchestra man, but you know, there are limits. And together with Farsalinos, there are others. I'm trying to join that group uh, because I'm already starting to publish things of this type, but uh, we're very few, we're very few. And in my case, I have to do it part-time because my main speciality is astrophysics and cosmology, not, not aerosol physics, although I know aerosol physics because I've learned about that, but it's not, I have to do it part-time. So it is a very unequal struggle. They have a lot of people. They've constructed a self-contained literature. You can cite hundreds of papers that are anti-vaping, ignoring the Royal College of Physicians, ignoring public health England, ignoring Farsalinos, ignoring everything, right? And uh, well, that's that's a problem, okay? So, heavy metals. Are vapors filling their lungs with heavy metals? See that, that woman? is vaping and it is uh, putting all these <laughs> metals inside of her body. That's horrible, isn't it? It's horrible. You're putting metals in your body. Yeah. Well, there is the early metal scandal, a study by the University of California here, uh, uh, Williams, uh, Villarreal, Bosilov, uh, uh, Lean, and Talbot. This is a group of researchers of University of California, and uh, they've done a lot of metal studies. And this is uh, one that they did that was uh, that uh, reached the headlines. Why? Because scary claim. They found that nickel in vapor was at concentrations 200 times that of cigarette smoke. Can you imagine that? <laughs> However, nickel is not an important metal in tobacco smoke. It is found in truly despicably negligible concentrations. Therefore, 200 times something despicably negligible is still despicably negligible, right? Yeah. But of course, the claim was that 200 times, and uh, yeah, that claim, uh, we've heard that even here in Mexico, it was one of the reasons why the president signed the prohibition decree. This one, this reason, okay? Mm -hmm. Now the refutation came by Farsalino, right? Farsalino re showed that all metal doses were below occupational toxicological references, right? So it was refuted. However, how many sites do you think that this article, you know, this article in, by the California people has hundreds of quotes, of citations, and the replication by Farsalino does not have even 50. So re refutations are not cited. And the scare study is widely cited. That's okay. how they control the narrative. They yeah. control the media too. 
they control the narrative, the media, and also when there is this type of scare, the scientists themselves uh, are a bit careful. They 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 are not the ones that propagate the uh, the scare. It is the media. It is CNN. It is uh, CBS News. All of them. And it is the newspapers, the headlines, the clickbait. These are the guys that propagate the scare, right? Yeah. And they propagate. Then there's another metal scandal. This is by people who work in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins. This was also very widely cited. And they claim that, that uh, they tested 56 devices. And um, they say that the nickel and lead and and I, I don't remember which other metal was, was above toxicological standards. And it was refuted again by Farsalinos and Rodi. What was the problem? Uh, these people did not go into, uh, they were careful not to do, not to go into dry heat. Uh, maybe not in, not in all the cases because they tested 56 and it is not very specific how each one of these 56 devices were tested. But they computed the daily dose in 40, in 24 hours of continuous intake when vapors, the intake of vapors, it's only when they inhale, when they vape. And uh, if you add the total number of, of time that the vapor is in your body, assuming 250, 300, puffs per day, it is half an hour, not 24 hours. So they were wrong between one and two orders of magnitude, right? But again, this paper has hundreds of citations and, uh, and Farsalinos and Rodo is not cited. I was once a referee on a metal study. Uh, it was a metal study on, the, on cannabis, right? Not on e-cigarettes. And uh, when they refer to nicotine, they mention this study. And I, as a referee, said, you have to mention the refutation. And when this, when the authors corrected and then follow my, my recommendations, they did not cite the correction. And I wrote, unless they cite the correction, this paper is not published. I, I oppose this paper publishing. So I had to insist to them to cite the refutation. People don't like refutations. That's one of the problems in science in general. People do not like to reproduce experiments. People do not like to report results that are not expected, that are seen as failures. People like to report successes, right? And this is a problem uh, of science in general. Not only, it is probably exacerbated here, right? So. Mm. Um, comparison with air pollution in Mexico City. This is a study I'm preparing and uh, I'm using this data uh, collected by, by and uh, they, they found a metal in, uh, a uh, metropolitan area. Mexico City is quite a polluted city, right? So I'm going to compare uh, somebody would inhale compared with, so with somebody vaping, and I'm going to use results of the previous study, the 56 devices, which is likely an overestimation, right? But still, I'm going to compare it with that. So. I'm going to assume that the average time spent outdoors is four hours because pollution indoors is different from pollution outdoors. It's different in terms of quantity and it's different in terms of pollutants. When you are indoors, you are exposed to different pollutants, but you can say that about 50% of the pollution indoors is originated outdoors, right? So then we're assuming uh, average number of puffs per day, 240, and the amount of uh, air breathed by an av average 
adult doing moderate activity is 20 cubic meters. So the values that are going to appear below are in nanograms. Nanogram is one billionth of a gram. And here we have the data. E-cigarette and air pollution. Take nickel. In four hours, a vapor would inhale uh, between 2.67 and 293. This number is like extremely likely an overheating condition because I'm using a research from 56 devices and the, the authors did not describe carefully what were these devices and how they were tested. And they were tested by machine. And as I tell, as I told you before, so all machine testing is overestimation, right? So this number you should take it with a grain of salt. Now, air pollution is one order of magnitude. Air pollution in four hours, right? E-cigarette in all day. See. Uh, nickel is the only one that is worrying, might equate air pollution. But this figure is over-exaggerated. Chromium, and you know chromium, uh, it's expected because a lot of resistance are made with alloys with chromium, right? So it's expected. 0.2258, almost three orders of magnitude. And these are the ranges, right? Now, lead, look at this. It's much more. Uh, four hours outdoors in Mexico City, it's much more than vaping every day, than vaping all day. Then manganese, that's another compound. And look at the numbers. So really, when people talk about they don't know what it is to live in Mexico City. Now you can ask me, suppose instead of Mexico City, we take Stockholm. Then these quantities are one order of magnitude less. But even then, we could say that e-cigarettes, and I'm talking about tank devices. I'm talking about tank devices, right? Uh, tank devices, some of them subom, perhaps because these guys did not explicitly say which devices were sub-ohm and one-ohm and above, would be comparable to air pollution in Stockholm, right? Or in a clean city. And if instead of tank devices, you have a pod or a small device, then vaping is even less than air pollution in Stockholm, right? I also have the numbers, but I, I, I still don't have it ready. But whenever people tell you about metals, believe me, there are more metals in air pollution, even in clean cities. Or let's say in a clean city is comparable to the, the amount of metals that you would inhale uh, with air pollution, with a tank device. But if you are vaping a small device, then it's even less than that. And let me tell you something, that some of the devices are better than others, right? So I don't want to name brands because I don't want people to say that I'm favoring one brand. But there, is, there are some brands that, are, <clears throat> that produce even less metals and that have a controls, they control overheating, right? So <clears throat> the, that's, the, that's the, the, the story on vaping, see? You can compare these figures here. It's interesting to compare them. These are the averages and the range. Mm -hmm. And okay, I think that uh, I think that I, uh, I will stop this first part. And uh, how are we on time? Um, you have uh, probably about ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. So something I would like to to show you very very quickly. It's, uh, let me stop sharing this one. Uh, where is the stop sharing? Um, um, uh, do you want me to remove it and then you reshare? Hold on. 
no, no, I, I can see it now. It's okay. just another, it's a stop screen. And I'm going to share another screen uh, just to comment very briefly. Um, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, this study, I'm going to share, I'm going to okay. share this screen here. Just to mention it, because I don't have time to discuss it. Share, share. Uh, now, where? Okay, share, share, share oh screen very fast. I already know how to do that window, and uh, yeah, this one, share. Okay. okay, this this is a study of metals. It was published. Uh, is, is this study of metals? Well, this study is by the same group of the uh, of the public health of uh, 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 Johns Hopkins, etc. These people going to go very fast. They tested metals, and uh, these are the devices that they tested. Okay. They tested a joule, a blue, and they tested two powerful uh, tank devices that work with a very small resistance, right, subom. But they mm -hmm. tested them with a protocol that is not appropriate. So for these two devices, they find they found huge amount of metals. And uh, this is problem. These are the tables that they found, not going to bore you, but they found huge amount of metals for these devices, right? Not for the small devices, for the small devices, they found what is expected, but because the puffing machines they use are appropriate for, for pods, but they are not appropriate for powerful devices. So this yeah. article is total, is, is completely wrong, and we are going to destroy it. Excellent. So I just wanted to show that. Now, why this is problematic, I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing this, this screen. Um, uh, let me Okay, we lost Roberto. Uh, hopefully he will come back. So um, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat and I will ask him when he comes back. Um, any comments? Is anybody out there? Peggy, yes, vaping is way safer than breathing in the air in Mexico City. This is true. It's also way safer than breathing the air in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, any of the main metropolitan cities that have um, petroleum using public transport. Okay, we'll wait and see if he comes back. I think Roberto is gone. Um, that's going to be the end of this. Sorry that it was done this way. Um, we will... Hold on a second. Yeah, Ian. Yes. Bonkers, those tests are wholly inappropriate for the open system devices. Wait, Roberto is back. Hold on. I am back uh, accidentally. I did something <laughs> accidentally. You know, when you get old, you get... The, finger the big be, fingers. I did something wrong. <laughs> yes. So now I just wanted to show you some. Um, I'm going to show you something else. Okay. It's uh, You've uh, got share five minutes. Share screen. Uh, well, then it's not going to be sufficient. But okay, I'll try and okay. uh, share screen and a window. Let's see which one I can share. That is interesting. Uh, applied science metals. Uh, okay, I'm going to share this one. Uh, the stuff is in Spanish, but uh, can you see it? Yes. But very small, right? So yes. this is a presentation um let, let me see where where it is where the window it's uh okay 
doing things fast is. Uh, I know. Okay. I know. It's okay. Okay. Everybody so, can see it. Uh, the stuff is in the stuff is in Spanish, but I'm going to speak in English. This is a presentation I gave in my institute, and uh, uh, this is based on, uh, on two articles that I published, and the idea was whether um, uh, environmental vapor can transmit um, the, the virus, the SARS-CoV virus. There are two published papers, and uh, well, uh, what I what I'm saying uh, this is another article. Okay, this is not important. And uh, yes, how do you compare the um, emissions from electron uh, from environmental vapor uh, with uh, other respiratory activities? Right, this is uh, the issue. And uh, ah, okay, vapor. Uh, this this is okay. Transmission, what the WHO says is that airborne transmission, um, et cetera. You know, this is what the WHO said about airborne transmission. And uh, I wanted, I was very anxious to prevent somebody like Glenn's uh, claiming that uh, vaping would transmit the virus because this is what they did with secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke will kill you. So people started hating smokers. I did not want COVID to be used with this idea with vaping. Like you are vaping in a street somewhere in California. And I mentioned California because it's the epicenter. It can be Australia also. It can be, I don't know, Massachusetts. It can be Denmark, Sweden. This country, Singapore, these countries are horrible for vaping. Um, mm -hmm. So what happens? You are vaping in a street in Stockholm. And people accuse you that you are that you are uh, con that you are a conta a putting them under contagion. So I wanted to prevent that, right? So the idea is that uh, well, this is an explanation of respiratory mechanics and so on, which is uh, modeled numerically, etc. This we all know. And so I'm going to try. What's the difference between vaping? In the case of vaping. The droplets are not only suspended in air, but they are suspended in air in an aerosol that is not biologic, that is diluted in air. And these particles make the whole thing visible, right? So one of the effects is that uh, the fact that vaping is visible is a safety measure, right? Because if somebody is speaking, is releasing much more viruses, but you do not see the jet, you do not see, but when somebody is vaping, you see the jet. And if you are outside of the jet, you are safe from direct contagion, right? So this was my claim. And this is a comparison between different respiratory activities and the amount of droplets, uh, respiratory droplets that will be released. And as you can see vaping, vaping at low intensity and high intensity, it is between normal breathing and murmuring, right? So this is to put in context the risk, right? But vaping is much safer because it's visible and because it's intermittent. You know, respiratory uh, normal breathing is not intermittent, it's continuous. Murmuring, talking, and, and singing, they take a long time. You know, how many, how many hours we talk every day? A lot, right? But vaping is intermittent. So this was just to put it into a context. This is more or less, the, this is as far as I know, the first aerodynamic study of a vapor jet, the vapor expiration. Uh, it is roughly like a conical, it's not exactly conical, but this is a model. And this is when you when we exhale, we can see this is in, uh, we, in, in or delay on air. Air in a, in a room is not static. It's moving in circular currents of about 10 centimeters per second. Roughly when you walk, you can see the direction that, is, uh, that comes from your mouth. And then when you, it's a puff, but it's, it's an interrupt puff. 
to stop the because surrounding air mixes and the air is normally doing circular motion and it becomes a turbulent vortex and it becomes a part. I don't know if you can see how your vapor, when you exhale it, it's like splits in different parts. And this is the process. And uh, as far as I know, the first time that is modeled physically. And uh, this is what happens. Like in a typical room, people talk, 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 and release this amount of, uh, of uh, viruses. As somebody infected without a mask. And then somebody uh, here is uh, sneezing. Sneezing is also intermittent, but it's very intense. Coughing is also a, it's, a, it's also intermittent, but it's also intense. Talking is a more dangerous one because it's sufficiently intense and sufficiently uh, uh, durable. And, and this would be the contribution of vaping. See? So vaping is really a very weak factor for COVID contagion, right? This is a graph that I wanted to show the, the relative risk uh, the normal control state is, is breathing because breathing is unavoidable. And so in, in a house environment, people don't use masks, right? So this is a state of unavoidable. This is 20%, 30% time, and this is coughing. This is the increase of. And so no, I just wanted to show. Now, in a restaurant, people say, oh, whenever you vape, you have to remove your mask. No, no, vaping is forbidden. But also, when people drink and eat, they have to, and they, they talk. When you're in a restaurant, people talk, people eat, people drink, and. Uh, it is much more than vaping. So that's nonsense because you also remove your mask to eat, right? So, okay, this, I think I will, uh, I will stop here. Muchas gracias. I wanted Thank to you. present something about respiratory, but I, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll talk about um, respiratory, all this claim by pneumologists and so on. Uh, these are based on very extremely weak evidence. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you for that. Everybody has really enjoyed it, and it's going to be definitely rewatched and watched. So, um, yeah. What, was, what are you doing? Oh, you just reshared it. I just took it out of the stream. I know. Yeah. Next yeah. up is going to be live. Is going to be ARDT Iberia America. I know you're on there as well in Spanish. So if anybody's yep. watching and they want the Spanish version, just stay tuned for another like hour or two and you'll be able to watch it. And as far as you and I are, I will see you tomorrow at the same time. Yeah, tomorrow I'm going to talk about environmental vapor. Some stuff that I presented now, it's already, a, I'm going to repeat a little bit of that, but especially environmental vapor because it's important. Uh, let me just say that many people who, who are with very good intentions and were very decent people, I respect a lot, they are obsessed with smoking cessation. And that's it. Smoking cessation and teenage vaping. That's it. Yeah, it's true. And okay. Roberto, you're breaking up really bad. I'm going to end this and I will see you again tomorrow. Nope. Everyone is saying thank you. Um, they've really appreciated it. And until tomorrow. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, everybody who's watching. And production, can we just go swipe and then... Yeah. The award that brings back was uh, <laughs> I hope they actually 